We're still continuing to study in the fifth chapter of the book of Ephesians. I would remind you that in the beginning of this book, when he says, Be ye therefore followers of God, or this chapter, as dear children, that the be ye is an imperative. That is, it's not a choice of yours. If you're going to be faithful, then here are the things involved in being faithful, and you must put them into practice. It's part of what it is to be a Christian. As we come on down, <clears throat> we see, we, as we close the lesson last week, we looked at uh, verse 11. And to these Christians and to all Christians, he says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful work, works of darkness, but rather reprove them. We talked a little bit about fellowship, and actually uh, several lessons lately. The Greek word koinonia is translated to fellowship. It means to participate in and to share. And so it is that we who are redeemed, who are sanctified, which means set apart, because we have from the heart obeyed the gospel, thus we're converted to Christ, no longer live as do the people who don't know Christ, who don't know the gospel, who don't live as the Bible teaches. And we pointed out at that time that it's not just a matter of not having fellowship with them, but we have an obligation to be faithful to reprove them. Now that has to do with exposing the error that they are teaching. It may not be comfortable, could even get you into trouble when you would say these things to reprove somebody concerning whatever error they're in or their conduct that's contrary to the teaching of the Bible. But after all, Christians are the light of the world. They are the salt of righteousness. They are expected to radiate Christ in their lives. And that wasn't just by godly example, which of course is what we're to be doing. But it also means using the mouth, if you please, or even using letter, whatever it might be, to teach people and show them right from wrong. I think the time that probably I had as big an effort in these areas was back when I was in state college years and years ago. And the young men around me, roughly my age, some a little older because I was a freshman when I was in that dorm. Uh, you can imagine just about what all they dealt with and did and said and how they did it. And I guess probably the thing that I did at that stage, only 17 and 18, to try to obey this passage was to simply, when they would be in the midst of something that wasn't very decent, and I mean mainly language, I would say something like, uh, would you be interested in a Bible study or would you want to go to services with me on Sunday? Well, at least at that time, most of those people had some sort of religion in their background that connected with the Bible. And though they weren't really intending to do much about it, they showed up around me. <laughs> and that was fine with me. And I had other ways of saying things that I had to think up how to do it to get them to see that I didn't approve of what they were saying. And I had an obligation to reprove them. If I can read and understand the English and it translates the original Greek, it says that right here, but rather reprove them. In other words, don't hold yourself back only from doing what they're doing, but point out the error, which means you also point out the right way. I found out in my first uh, fundamentals of speech class that on certain speeches they assigned us to do, I hadn't even preached my first sermon at that time. I just decided, well, I'm taking this to learn how to stand up before people and communicate with them. So uh, you haven't lived if you've preached on the evils of dancing to a state college class of freshmen <laughs> or abortion, as I did once. But the thing about it is, in those days, most of them came from some sort of biblical background, and they weren't about to challenge it. They might wink at it or they might steer clear of me 
But if they're going to practice those things, that suits me fine. They do steer clear of me. And I got into it with some teachers over things like that. But I'm just telling you how I did it. I don't know how you may do it, but I can tell you this. You're going to do it or you won't be faithful. It says, but rather reprove them. Now you notice Paul says to Timothy in preaching the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now you may say, well, that's how preachers to operate. If you're a member of the church, according to your several abilities, that applies to you too, wherever you're found on the job or in the school or in the home or wherever it is. So it's a part of this. You know, he didn't say, now understand, verse 11 applies only to those who are full-time gospel preachers or maybe elders. It doesn't apply to any other member of the church. You can keep your mouth shut all you want to and never say a word to rebuke anybody or reprove anybody for their wrong actions. Does it say that? That is an imperative. You're faithful. Faithful people do this. Well, I'm faithful. I don't do it. You're not faithful. You may be obedient in some areas, but you're not fully faithful. Then he talks about some of the situations here, the times they lived in and the immorality that governed the Roman Empire. And he says, For it's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. The unfruitful works of darkness are always disgraceful. And this is not to suggest that it's shameful to reprove them. For Paul's already admonished us, didn't he, to do that in clear terms. Of course you realize that the shame mentioned here is on the part of those who practice these secret things. And, of course, they've acknowledged that they've practiced it in recent years, at least one kind of immorality, because they say, I've come out of the closet. <laughs> now, what are they saying? Well, they're saying what I used to do in private because I was ashamed of it, didn't want to have to feel the impact of it because culture and society didn't uh, accept it. Now things have got to where I can stand up and tell you, outright and openly, without any fear of any kind at all, that I'm a homosexual, or I'm a transvestite, or I'm a whatever. Now, Paul says that this is a shame. I think, too, it says that we have to be careful in reproving error like this, that we don't get into the vividness of it and trying to describe how wicked it is. You ever notice the Bible doesn't hold back whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament in specifying particular sins. But it does it in a way that is wholesome. Now, what do I mean by that? A wholesome way of speaking without your having to get down in the gutter and say what they say to describe it or speak as they speak in describing it. When you hear of Homosexuality in the Old Testament, you never read homosexuality. But you'll have it described. Romans says men with men working that which is unseemly. They got to that stage because they did not desire to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them up to these terrible things. To do that which is even against nature. It's not even natural, so they cultivate it. But notice how it describes it. It describes their wickedness and their vileness without using their terminology, their what I call gutter terminology. And Paul didn't hesitate to reprove, reprove even the most shameful and disgraceful conduct then when you read Romans 1, verses 18 through 22. And so we should be as honorable as we possibly can in letting our lights as Christians shine, but we choose the proper words. I don't mind saying that uh, sodomites still walk this earth, period, plenty of them. But that doesn't mean that uh, I hate them. I would like to see them in hell. 
any more than I hate the adulterer and would like to see them in hell. Or the fornicator and would love to see them in hell. You know, one of the things as far as a byword that's been used for, I don't know, as long as there's been wicked people, people will tell one another, well, go to hell. Now, I want you to realize what you're saying to a person when you say that to them, if you really meant it and understood what hell really is, what are you really saying? It's really right the opposite of the Christian's attitude. You don't want anybody to go to hell. Does God want everybody to go to hell or anybody to go to hell? No. He's done all that deity can do to save free moral agents. He can't make you because you have to choose obey Him. He'll not stop you from obeying Him. He'll do everything that's right to encourage you to respond to the gospel from the heart and obedience and being baptized to Christ and to live a converted life in Christ. And thus, we said in the beginning, said it many times lately, most of the New Testament's written to those who have been baptized to Christ for the remission of sins, have been added to the church, and are Christians, teaching them how to live, warning them, correcting them, reproving them when they go astray from the straight, narrow way of truth. So when evil deeds are exposed to the light, they are made manifest by the light. That is, they are exposed. See verse 13 here. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Well, light's truth. Light is truth. Darkness is error and sin. Now if we want this world... The people separated from God and still dead in their trespasses and sins. If we want them to know the way to heaven, to know the way of the forgiveness of sins, and all sins ultimately against God, and God therefore does the forgiving, then we're going to sound out the truth or shine the light of truth upon it. I think one of our greatest needs is to turn the searchlight of truth upon the works of darkness so that they may be seen for what they in reality are. We see in the falling away of the church, as Paul warns Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, that false teachers would arise apostate they will be working simply for their own desires and their conscience would be seared as it were with a hot iron. And they were hypocrites. They would be tickling the ears of the people, not causing them to have pricked hearts, being ashamed of their sin because the truth shined upon them and revealed their sins. And we must be careful of that. So sin has been often sugar-coated so that sin is made to be no more sin. Evil is no more evil, and darkness is mistaken for light. I've seen that happen in the church over the many years I've preached, experienced it in different congregations, that when you dealt with sin in the sense of sin's wrong, sin separates from God, your sins must be forgiven, that was all right. But if I said mechanical instruments of music and the worship to God is sin, well, if I said the Lord's Supper can only be taken up scripturally on the first day of the week in the worship assembly of the church, well, if I say that people outside the church that Jesus built and that you read of in your New Testament, the church he purchased with his blood and began on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, Christ adds all the saved to that church and there are no saved out of it. And the denominations do not have anything to offer but error, they are not the church. Then you'll see how quickly some brethren are more like them than they are like the Apostle Paul. I mentioned a while back, it has been long ago, Ken finished teaching on Wednesday night on logic. The major premise is where you say, 
sin is bad. Well, everybody rise up and say, sin is bad. The minor premise is where you say, John sinned. Therefore, John's bad. John, I'm looking at you, but I don't mean it. Unless it applies. So, so nevertheless, I'll look at Ken next time. Nancy agree with me if I say anything along that line. But the point is, that's the way it is with me when I read my Bible. I ought to think that way. I ought to think that way. We like sermons that says sin's bad. Major premise. We don't like sermons where you come to that minor premise and you get particular. We don't like that. That upsets us. But that's what he's talking about here when he says these things that are done in secret ought to be reproved and the reproof of the light being shined upon them. I've said this the last couple of weeks. A lot of people really don't understand what sin is. We could say generally it's a transgression of the law, and it is 1 John 3, 4. But what falls in that category of transgression of the law? We're to do only what's authorized by Jesus Christ, our Savior, for He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by Him, John 14, 6. And He has all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18. People say, that's all right. But what I point out from the Scriptures, that, well, what you're doing, you have no Bible authority for it. Whoops. I happen to like to do that. My family loves to do that. And so now you as we go to say you've, you've quit preaching and gone to meddling. Well, the kind of preaching that accomplishes something is where the light of truth specifically falls upon things and shines and makes it clear that that's wrong. You have to do that in your own life. Before you became a Christian, you were thinking about it, however old or young you were. What made you respond to the gospel invitation to obey the gospel? Because you thought everything was all right in your life and there was no sin in your life and you didn't need God? Or was it the preaching of the gospel exposed by the light of truth things in your life that you knew God did not approve of in his word and you wanted to be acceptable to God and your heart was pricked with the truth as the light of truth shined on it and so you accepted the truth of God and obeyed it we live in a world that much like Isaiah lived in as we've been studying on Sunday morning in the class Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20 Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil and put darkness for light. What he's saying is it puts error and falsehood for the truth. And right the opposite, light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Isaiah 5 and verse 20. One thing we learn about this, from this, is though that was... Uh, probably 27, 2800 years ago when this was written, when Isaiah was doing his work, people haven't changed, have they? So the Ephesians here, and all of us, were encouraged to, as he says, awake from sleep and arise from the dead. And Christ shall give thee light, chapter 5, verse 14. Why would he say this to Christians? They heard the gospel, they believed it, they were pricked in their heart of their sins, they repented of their sins, they confessed their faith in Christ, they were baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. They knew what the worship of the church was, they were doing it. Why don't you say, awake out of sleep? Because it's so easy for any one of us to be lulled into a certain thing and we, let, we drift. We just drift. Now, I know we've all, at least I'm assuming most of us at least, have been fishing. We've been in a boat, and the water's moving, and we're fishing, and we're unconscious of it moving until if we've got a pole especially that's fixed, not necessarily a reel and casting. And the next thing you know, we're having to reach further and further back there to get in that spot where we caught one or two fish because the boat drifts and we're unconscious of it. What do they do for boats to get them to stay in one place? They have an anchor. 
And we have a song that reminds us of that. We have an anchor. What are we saying when we say that? We've got that which will keep us from drifting. And it's Christ and His Word, and we're taught to examine ourselves to see how we're doing in living. And sometimes we may have to rebuke ourselves. I, I don't know how you live the Christian life and not rebuke yourself. But it's all too easy to justify yourself. And that's the easiest thing. How old is, is it that people would operate that way? How, how long has it been going on? What did Eve do? What did Adam do? And of course it starts out by blaming somebody else or not admitting really what's what. These people and so many Christians need to come out of their lethargy and indifference and to exercise their senses, as the writer of Hebrews said, to discern both good and evil, Hebrews 5, to discern both good and evil, people that don't have a working knowledge of the New Testament. And they may have gone through two or three generations. Nowadays that could be where we are with this world having become more secular, and more ignorance of the Bible than ever before in our nation. People need to have pointed out to them just where they've gone wrong. I, I believe there are people who just don't know. And they're not going to know unless we turn the light on. Unless we turn the light on. You know, I was brought up in Arkansas and we did a lot of hunting. Some of the first recollection that I remember as a little bitty boy was wanting to go coon hunting with daddy because in those days when I was little he always had two or three hounds and I had going with people who had other hounds and they were going coon hunting in the Washtenaw River bottoms and so on and they would have two different kinds of lights in those days you could have a carbide light <clears throat> that was your cheap light <clears throat> enough light came out of that to where you could walk with it but then you had a big old flashlight about that long <laughs> That one put out a beam, and you didn't want to turn it on until you got right there looking up the tree because you want to run the batteries down. And so the dogs would tree, finally, and you'd try to get that coon to look at you. Well, a coon can get pretty smart because you try and see his eyes up there in that big tree. And a coon can do this and will do this. <laughs> But then he will look, and of course, if he's big enough, and they're all not little, shine that beam on him, he makes him stand out where you can see him. That's the idea anyway. That's what we need to be able to discern both good and evil. It needs, the truth needs to shine brightly. We don't need to speak as if we're trying to say the truth and not say it so we won't bother anybody. Well, how do you do that? Here's how Peter did it, as the Holy Spirit guided him to do it, and we must know he was speaking with the other apostles as they did the same. He said to those people, and they were devout religious people. That's the way Luke describes them. They weren't people who didn't care about God. They were there doing what they thought they ought to do according to the law of Moses on the day of Pentecost. And Peter stood up there and said, Ye have taken and with wicked hands have crucified and slain the Son of God. We'll never know how much boldness that took on Peter's part and the other apostles to preach like that. Because not many days before that, they took the one they preached and because he confessed himself to be the Son of God and nailed him to a cross. We don't have to be that concerned in this nation about that. Some places they do. But what are we doing to be the light of the world and to expose sin for what it is and specific sins? Do we even try? Do we even use where we are and the people we are around? Are their souls important? Did Christ die for them? Am I a member of the church charged with preaching the gospel? Do I have the obligation but rather reprove them? 
How can you get them to repent of sins? They don't know for sure what some sins even are. So it needs to be stated plainly. As Paul said to the Romans, it's high time to awake out of sleep. He went ahead and said, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Romans 13, 11 through 14. That's our job. It's not just the elders, the deacons, the preachers. Each one of us wearing the name Christian, which means of Christ, have that obligation. We wonder and we scratch our heads and say, why can't we find people who would study the truth and who'd want to be like they once were? Well, you couldn't see that coon up in that tree sometimes till you shine that bright light on him. And sometimes he might cover up his eyes, but he covered up his eyes to keep from seeing that bright light. And you knew you'd found him. And so it is then with so many things when it comes to living the Christian life. You see, we're not talking about having to know Greek and Hebrew and all the old original far or eastern, mid-eastern languages and going to school for all these years. It's, it's just like... <laughs> Heard many years ago, a person came into congregation of mostly just ordinary farmers and people like that, no high educated people, formal education. Fella never had been to a worship assembly of the Lord's Church, and he noticed there wasn't any piano, organ, or any mechanical instrumental music. And he walked up to one old man and said, why ain't you got no pioneer in here? The old man looked at him and says, I ain't no Bible for it. That's as good answer as you can give. If I were debating somebody on the kind of music God authorizes whereby he would be worshipped, I might not say it like that. But everything I would do is simply say, everything this man says, and he said a lot, because that's what they would do has not been able to find you one verse where mechanical answer for music or whistling or stomping or clapping is used in the worship of God. And then I would produce simply the passages such as Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16 to say, now that's what the New Testament of Christ says concerning music. It says sing. Now he can say whatever else he wants to, and he would. You can't stop people from quibbling. But I bring them right back to that every time. He has no Bible for it. There ain't no Bible for it. We stand or we fall on whether we have authority from God in God's rightly divided Bible. And if we don't have any authority for the, what we do from the New Testament of Jesus Christ, then we don't have any business doing it. And if it's specifically forbidden, we don't have any business doing it. So we act upon the idea, here's the written word, written in language on our level to understand the mind of God. And I can know what he wants. Some people act like, well, he gave us a Bible, but he didn't ever expect us to understand it. Well, that's ridiculous. All scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. That's what we've been talking about. For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into every good work. American Standard says completely furnished into every good work. I like that a little better, but I grew up on the King James, and that's the reason I quote it most often. The Bible's complete for the Christian to learn right from wrong and to be able to answer every error that arises in his own life, his family's life, anybody else's life. And if there's no authority from Christ for it, Leave it alone. Sometimes we could uh, 
we could easily say some things to people by just simply asking them a question when they're talking about whatever it is. Just simply ask, where's your authority from Jesus Christ, whom you say you love and he's your king, for acting like you act, for speaking like you speak? You've got to make some people think. And they may swell up at you, as they used to say. They may push their lip out at you. But what are they going to do about it? All you did was ask them a question. Now, you'll notice that when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that the Lord accomplished some of his greatest upheavals among people by knowing the questions to ask. Now, I'm not saying we're infallible like the Lord, but I'm saying we can follow him as the master teacher, of which there's no greater, and we can try like in everything else to be like him, for he's left us an example that we should follow in his steps. How do I know what those steps are? I can read my Bible. I can understand it if I want to may take some time, but yeah, that's right, it does. To study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And there's no telling what we could do if we just learn when people are doing whatever they do and saying whatever they say, to say, well, where's your Bible for it? Where does the Bible say anything about that? Because how are you going to say there's any more ultimate, infallible, primary source for Christianity than the Bible in general and the New Testament in particular. In graduate work, especially history, they want you to use primary sources. That's like if you're studying Thomas Jefferson, be about letters from Thomas Jefferson, things Thomas Jefferson wrote. That's a primary source. And historians deal with that all the time. That's what they like. Get a hold of that. That's about as close as you can get to the person. Paul said when, uh, to the Ephesians, by the way, when you read what I wrote, you'll understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. What does that tell us about why he wrote these letters? To enlighten us. So we would know what Paul knew. Somebody says, you can't know what they knew. Well, then what's that verse mean? And so when we're talking about walking as they walked, we're talking about walking in wisdom. Look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now, the King James says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time for the days are evil. This is a good place to make our final comments for today on this study. The walk here is living the Christian life. And he says, you walk circumspectly. Circumspectly is to look at the whole circumference around you. When I was, would be on a deer stand years ago, anybody knows anything about deer hunting know you've got to keep your ears and eyes working very well, examining all the way around you, without doing too much moving on your part. You're vigilant, and if you do much hunting, you learn to hear the difference in the way things sound. Because you learn from experience how things sound when they move through the woods and the trees. Many times squirrel hunting, I've looked up a tree, a pin oak tree, and it kind of looked like just at the first moment that was a squirrel, as we would say, cutting an acre. And you'd realize a blue jay up there. Which is also an indicator if a blue jay is hitting them, it could be a squirrel there somewhere. And so you're very observant. But when that squirrel hits that limb, you know immediately it's squirrel because he only makes that kind of move. No bird does. And it might be also because of the way blue jays and their disposition is, or or is, again, <laughs> the way they are, that there's going to be a fuss between the two. And you've got to remedy it in the fuss. Well, what does that have to do with anything since we, we, we live in the world? We're, we're in the world where kids are sidewalk kids or blacktop kids. They don't know much about getting around a bush except to mow around it. 
but I didn't grow up that way. And so you learn to examine all sides of the matter to see the way they work because you know how they work. So see that you walk circumspectly. Not as fools. Fools go through this life not learning a thing from it. Living for themselves, living for the moment, never considering anything about the end of days, the end of this world, and coming in judgment before Jesus Christ. Do you ever contemplate walking up to the judgment seat or bar of Christ and what it will be like to give your account to him. You ever think about that? Well, we ought to. I don't know why a day should go by we shouldn't think about that. Maybe several times a day. Because that's real. When it comes down to that, everything we've done in this life is going to say we either are fools or we're faithful. But it's wise. A wise person loves the truth. A wise person wants to follow the truth. Notice when we do this, we're redeeming the time. We're buying it back. Too much time's already been spent in foolish things. So we're buying it back. And we know this is the important matter, and he tells us why. Because the days are evil. Remember Wednesday night, for those of you in that class, we pointed out that John said in verse John 5, that the devil has the control in this world. The whole world lieth in wickedness. So as the American standard says, the whole world lieth under the power of the evil one. And he's like a lion that goeth about seeking whom he may destroy. That's what he's doing. He's doing that right now. He's not going to quit any second of the day. Well, then we must be diligent. We must have this walk in wisdom we must be circumspect. Colossians 4, 5, and I'll end on this. Paul is admonishing the Christians at Colossae, walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Again, redeeming the time. In other words, how do we pay attention to how we conduct ourselves before those who are not Christians? Now, people in business who are Christians need to be mindful of that. that's how they do their business. How we act around our neighbors, around church members, and non-church members. We're cautious to act as children of light, living according to the light of truth. Well, there's much more here. We'll try to wind it down. But I call this milking this thing for everything it's worth. And I guarantee you to get through, you go back through it and do it some more. But if you're not a child of God this afternoon, we beg of you to consider these matters. There has to be a beginning point. The beginning point is hearing the gospel and understanding it, knowing it's God's power to save, and then adhering and submitting to God's plan of salvation, believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Christ, the Son of God, and being baptized in Christ for the remission of sins. If a child of God, you've wandered away from Christ, you've committed sin, then we urge you to be humble, repent of those sins, confess them before God, and ask for forgiveness. If you're therefore subject to the great invitation of our Lord, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.